Hello and welcome to the 11th evening of the Rick Steves Tours Festival of Europe. Tonight, we will be exploring one of my favorite regions, the countries of Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic. My name is Ben Green, and I'll be your moderator as we travel with Cameron and Katka. And now, without further ado, I would like to turn things over to our host tonight, a guidebook co-author, guidebook researcher, and tour guide in this region for over 20 years, Cameron Hewitt. Good evening, Cameron. Hello there, Ben, and thank you so much for that kind introduction. I'm very excited to welcome all of you to go to three of my favorite countries, places very, very close to my heart. And I'll be joined in just a few minutes uh, by my special co-host, tour guide Katka from Prague. Uh, but first, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about what we're doing right now here at Rick Steves Europe. Uh, I am one of about 100 people who work in Edmonds, Washington, our home office and about 125 tour guides, most of them based in Europe. And January is our month to celebrate our Festival of Europe. So if this is your first session, you might, uh, or you might already know this, we have 22 nights in a row of presentations just like this one. Each night we have a guide who's zooming in from Europe to share, you the, uh, share their perspectives from their region. Rick is handling 17 of these 22 himself, but I'm doing a little bit of a guest host stint here to give him a breather. Uh, so I did Scotland last night, tonight, Czech Republic, Poland, and Hungary. Tomorrow, I'll be doing Croatia and Slovenia with our friend Tina Hidi from Slovenia. If you're looking at the schedule here, you'll notice we're about halfway through. So for the ones that have already happened, in case you missed them, they're all archived on our website. So you can go to ricksteves.com and you can watch them anytime you want. And we have a whole basically two and a half weeks or a week and a half coming up of, of yet more of these wonderful presentations after Croatia, Slovenia. Tomorrow, we'll be doing Sicily on Saturday and so forth. The one I wanted to call your attention to is on Monday. Uh, we're doing a very special edition of Monday Night Travel. Rick will be joined by his COO, Craig Davidson from Rick Steves Europe. And Craig and Rick together have come up with an amazing uh, plan that we try to sort of reduce our carbon footprint. It's a climate smart commitment. And Craig will be explaining this ingenious way that he and Rick have sorted out, mainly Craig, uh, for how we're going to try to deal with the fact that we fly people over to Europe and end up consuming a lot of carbon, emitting a lot of carbon. And I think Craig does a beautiful job of explaining that. It's called Ethical Travels in a Warming World. So that's a good one to tune in for on Monday. By the way, also on Monday, we're gonna do our next big tour giveaway during this Festival of Europe. Every Monday, we're giving away a free one-week city tour to London, Paris, Rome, or Istanbul. And if you'd like to be eligible for that contest, you can go on the website and sign up. You can see the link right there. Also, tomorrow you'll be emailed, uh, emailed a follow-up to this program, and there'll be information there about how to sign up for this tour giveaway. And the other special event going on as part of our Festival of Europe, if you are interested in a Rick Steves tour, this is a great time to book. You get $100 off per seat as long as you book by the end of January, January 31st, and use the promo code FEST23 that you see there on your screen. Uh, that's a great way if, if you're kind of on the fence about booking a tour. Part of our intention with these programs is to help kind of nudge you off the fence, help you make a decision, and we'll sweeten the pot by taking $100 off the price through the end of this month, as long as you use that promo code. Speaking of tours, we're going to be talking today about some of the easternmost tours on this map of Rick Steves tours, and there's really three tours in particular that involve these countries. We've got our best of Eastern Europe in 15 days. That's kind of the grand tour, the three great cities of these countries we're talking about, Prague and the Czech Republic, Krakow and Poland and Budapest and Hungary, plus some beautiful parts of Croatia and Slovenia. For something a little bit more focused, we've got an eight day tour that's just Prague and Budapest. And then we have a new tour we just started running last year, the best of Poland in 10 days. I'm very excited about this tour. And the last part of the show, I'll be giving you a quick overview of this beautiful tour. Uh, I was actually the tour guide on the very first ever departure just this past May. It's a wonderful itinerary, and we're really excited to tell you about this new tour. If you're looking for something new, if you've done a bunch of Rick Steves tour and you're thinking about branching out to a, a new itinerary, this is an outstanding one to choose. Uh, by the way, I've talked a lot about tours so far, but I want to reassure you, we're really designing this program tonight, not just for tour members, I would say it's every bit as useful, maybe even more useful for independent travelers. The vast majority of what we'll talk about here tonight is practical advice for anyone who's going to these countries. If you are going to these countries, you're going to want to pick up a good guidebook. Uh, I'm the co-author, as Ben said, of our Eastern Europe guidebook and our Budapest guidebook. And we have an outstanding Prague guidebook as well. Our co-author for that book is actually a Czech friend of ours who lives in Prague. Um, and so I would say, be sure to equip yourself with good information if you're traveling independently. 
And of course, we have this Q&A offered this evening. If you can put your questions in the widget anytime you like, and we'll try to answer as many as we can at the end of the program tonight. As I said, I'm the co-author of the Rick Steves Eastern Europe books, and I've, I've been working with Rick for almost 23 years, and I'm kind of known around the office as Mr. Eastern Europe. I've really devoted my career, a big chunk of my career, to these three countries we're going to talk about tonight. And I think a lot about what is it that, that draws me to these places. I just, I just can't get enough of them. So let me just kind of think through some of the things that make me really excited about the Czech Republic and Hungary and Poland. One of my favorite things about these regions is the way they kind of upend expectations. I think a lot of folks still have these Cold War associations with these countries, for people of a certain generation especially, kind of remember the Iron Curtain. And this is part of the kind of mysterious communist bloc. And they might still have this sort of an impression when you go to Eastern Europe, these are the kinds of scenery that you're gonna be enjoying. In fact, the reality is a lot more like this. So I think my first thing I wanna say is, put those kind of Cold War blinders aside and remember this is a whole new day. Communism is a 30, it's 30 years in the past, much more than 30 years in the past. It's something that everyone here has kind of completely forgotten about. In fact, it's been a real joy for me over the last 25 years or so that I've been traveling in these countries to see those changes happen. That's one of the exciting things about these countries. This is an important building, the Sechenyi Bath Complex in Budapest, Hungary. I took this picture probably around 2001, 2002, and I went back just a few years later, and it looked like this. I'm going to show you that again. And I just would hope if you don't know much about these countries and you might think that they look sort of like this, I hope through the uh, course of this presentation, you'll realize that the reality today is quite different. Speaking of quite different, another thing I love about the area that we're gonna talk about today is these countries are completely different. Again, I think Americans tend to mush them together and oh, aren't they all kind of variations on the same? And I would say not so fast. Uh, each of these countries is extremely different. I would say the Czech Republic, Hungary, and Poland are probably about as different culturally as let's say Germany, France, and Italy. They are very different places and each one has their very proud traditions and customs and their own language and their own cuisines. And so one of the things Katka and I will be doing tonight is helping you understand those differences and be a little more savvy in the way you think about these three places. Each of these countries is dominated by one great city. So you've got the Czech Republic is Prague. You've got Krakow in Poland. There's a lot more to Poland, of course, as well. But Krakow is sort of the main town that a lot of people go to in Poland. And of course, you've got uh, Budapest in uh, Hungary. We're going to talk mainly about these three big cities, but along the way, we're going to talk a lot about the cultures associated with them. By the way, this is a lot of ground to cover, and I've been lobbying for years. Why don't we have a whole hour for Poland? Why don't we have a whole hour for the Czech Republic? So far, that's fallen on deaf ears. So we're trying to cram three very different countries into one session. And for that reason, do you remember back in the day, your favorite TV shows used to have supersize episodes that would be an extra 15 or 20 minutes? I just will want to prepare you right now. This is going to go a little bit long tonight. We kind of aim for an hour and 15 minutes, including Q&A, and I've warned our moderators. It's probably going to be an hour and a half because there's just so much to cover in each of these three countries. And we're also going to be talking about a very important topic, which is the invasion of Ukraine, which is quite close to some of these places. And we're going to take some extra time here at the beginning in just a moment to sort of talk through in case you have any concerns or worries about traveling here uh, during this sort of uh, very eventful time in this region's history. And we want to kind of explain kind of what the differences are between Ukraine and the places that we're going to be going to. So strap in, sit tight, and uh, thanks for your patience in advance. We've got a lot to share. Um, and we're going to show you, in addition to those great cities, some beautiful small towns. We're going to show you some unique experiences. I'm thinking, for example, of the thermal baths here in Budapest, in Hungary. The thing that really keeps me coming back to this region, though, are the wonderful people. I just find it so easy and so rewarding to connect with the people of these countries. And that goes extra for our wonderful tour guides in these countries. We have an excellent, outstanding team of tour guides uh, with our Rick Steves tour program in each of these countries. Here's a picture of B, who's one of our great Polish tour guides. Uh, we've got great Hungarian guides as well. We've got Peter Pultzman and we've got Atelka. And joining me right now at three o'clock in the morning from her house in Prague, I want to introduce you to one of our outstanding Czech guides, Katka Svobodova. Katka, are you awake? Are you uh, are you with us here? I am awake. Thank you very much for inviting me. Oh, and we're so honored yes. to have you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Three o'clock, no problem for us here. <laughs> very happy well, to join you anytime. As and you know. you've been, tell us a little bit about yourself. I know you've, I've known you for at least 15 uh, years. How long have you been working with us here? 
Yeah, I, I think I've been working well nowadays, maybe more than 17 years as I've been in 2004, I think it was the year when I met Rick first time ever. I was this private guide in Prague, not really knowing much about the business, about you know the TV shows, about loads of things, what I learned later on. And just the next year, I started to also lead tours around this region, and I've been just enjoying it so far. I never really thought of this dream job <laughs> when I was little. You know, uh, growing up in communism, we really did not have any tourism here at all. And then it was because of the interest of the people. That's actually how it all slowly started, you know, step by step. So very it's, happy it's, to see. It's hard to imagine considering how popular Prague is these days, but we're, we're very fortunate to have you and especially it's so late at night. Now, I know in a lot of these countries, you cannot say hello and greet somebody without a little bit of a special drink. So I came That's prepared, Petka. I've got a bottle of a very important Czech li liquor called wow, Mecherovka. Yeah. Mecherovka. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about this and why it's why it's important. Why it's what's it's I know a lot of Czechs really enjoy this. Yes, well, Becherovka is one of those liquors we like to greet you with. If it's not Slivovitz, the plum brandy, this one is amazing because it also helps you to digest all this great food we make here, but can be sometimes a little heavy for your stomachs. So we basically say this is a miraculous drink, you know, to help you to, to go through this. Becherovka, it's an herb liquor. It's not that strong. It's just 38% of alcohol, I think. And we also love it to, to drink it together with tonic. So sometimes it is called like baton, Becherovka and tonic, one of the very popular long drinks in the country. And am I right? Have it on its own. Beton has another meaning as well? Beton has another meaning as well. That's actually concrete because you may feel like a concrete, you know, block after you drink too much of it. <laughs> well, we'll go easy, but do you, do you have a cup there? I'd like to pour you a oh, little yes, bit. Oh, yes, I do. I do. Please, if you can pour me a little, I'll yeah. be happy Hold to take up. a sip me, with you. Let me just give you a little bit there. Okay, okay. thank Great. you. Yes, okay. I oh, I gave you, I gave you too much. So just take, only have it's as much as you want. Cup, there. But we can manage for three will, a.m. is just I, a perfect size. I will Cheers. do just... <laughs> I'll just do a little bit myself. How do you say cheers in Czech? I know we're going to teach people this later, but remind me. Happy to tell you, we say na zdraví, na zdraví. What do na we zdraví. mean by that? To your health. To your because health. Because we do believe it's good for your health. Na, na zdraví. zdraví. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, whew, it's very herbal. Very nice. Only 38% alcohol. So, you know, oh, I'm yeah. going to I'm gonna set this aside. I've got a lot of work to do tonight. So. Uh, great. Well, thank you for joining us, Katka. And I think together we're going to get going. And the first thing we want to talk about is to sort of clarify some terms. I've already used the term Eastern Europe to describe these countries, and that's perfectly fine. But what I think would happen if you end up going to these countries, people like Katka, as soon as you arrive, will very gently and politely and diplomatically correct you. This is not Eastern Europe. What do you like to call it, Katka? Well, you know, of course, from one point of view, it is Eastern Europe, but this is basically really just the, you know, the time of Iron Curtain. That was the time when we were all of a sudden divided into these two halves and we looking at each other here in my country like, oh, we are now an Eastern European country. OK, so this is, of course, how we can take it. But on the other hand, from different perspectives, if geography, even historically, you know, we've never been tied to Russia as the empire. So we really don't feel to be as Eastern Europeans. But uh, that's why I would say that maybe let's 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 be diplomatic in that way, really, that we would call this region to be central eastern part of Europe. And I think that we can take both of these aspects together. And that's perfectly all right like that. OK, central eastern. I've taken the liberty on our map. I decided to kind of make this demonstration for our viewers. And I've drawn a grid to show what is basically the very, very center of Europe. And if you notice, Czech Republic is almost touching the central point of Europe. I also want to point out that Prague is farther west than Vienna. It's farther west than Stockholm. It's farther west than an awful lot of Italy. And so I think this is part of that I mentioned earlier. You have to adjust your assumptions and expectations. And this is why the people in these countries like to call themselves Central Europeans. And I, I we, we call our tours and our guidebooks, you know, I, I wrote a guidebook that we call Eastern Europe. And that's because we understand that Americans who haven't been there, that's the term they use for this area. But once you have been there, I think a lot of people come home and say, oh, you know, it's really Central Europe. There's another reason it's very important. And this is where we're going to get into all the fun talk about these beautiful countries in a moment. But we kind of wanted to talk about the elephant in the room. And that is the recent Ukraine invasion 
and how it's affecting things. And I think this ties in with that. It's what Kak had sort of just said. We might think of these countries as Eastern Europe. Well, Ukraine is in Eastern Europe, and there's some bad things, some terrible things happening there, and it's easy to mush them together. But we wanted to talk about what's the reality right now of, of uh, this war that's going on just out on the on the eastern fringe of this area and how it's affecting. Now, I want to say right away, we do not want to diminish what the terrible, terrible things that are going on in Ukraine. It's just horrifying every night to see what's happening on the news there. On the other hand, uh, Katka and I, we, we've gotten together a few times in recent days to prepare for this. And we're just both, we're frustrated and frankly, we're kind of sad because we know how wonderful these places are. These countries are just so deserving of your attention. And yet uh, people don't seem to be going there as much this year. Our tour sales are a little down, our guidebook sales are a little down, and we don't care about the money. We just care about the number of people who get to these beautiful places. Um, so we thought we'd talk a little bit about, should you be concerned about this if you're thinking about it? And I've, I've zoomed in on this map here. And the first point I wanna make is just a geopolitical one. The big difference between Ukraine and these countries is Poland and the Czech Republic and Hungary and Slovakia and a lot of those neighboring countries are part of the European Union and they're a part of NATO. And, you know, we don't really know what Putin's going to do. He's very unpredictable. But one thing that we do know is Putin understands that there's a bright red line where NATO begins. And therefore, uh, the idea that the war is going to sort of spill over into, into Poland or into Hungary or something, um, if let's just say if that did happen, we'd have a lot worse problems than just that we're on vacation in, in Poland at the time. Uh, it would be a very bad situation. In fact, to make the point of this, there you might have remember a few months ago, an errant Russian rocket actually crossed over the border and landed in Poland. And the fact that that was a huge news story and people were worried about it for a couple of days just demonstrates uh, the, the fact that that would, that would be a, a really major and frightening turning point that's, that's kind of hard to fathom. I mean, Katka, what do you think about this? As someone who lives in a country that's, that's not too far, do you, does that give you a sense of safety? Uh, yes, I mean, definitely. Of course, you know, at the beginning when it all started, you know, I was afraid, frankly, just saying, but I think that this is just a normal reaction to a shock, because I did not really think that I will experience, you know, in uh, modern days, you know, in civilized Europe, such a thing what just started over there. Uh, so so I, I do understand that, of course, people might have been at the beginning, at least, you know, afraid. But I must also say that, like, uh, you know, here it was even a little more complicated, like in my own personal story, because I have two boys. And of course, I did kind of picture that now I will have to pack, you know, and leave somehow. And this is what my granny experienced uh, at the beginning of the Second World War when she needed to leave the Sudetenland, you know, the borderland of my country, because it was taken over by the Nazis. So all this, of course, made me very nervous. I was even a little panicking. But then very soon afterwards, exactly knowing the fact that now we are part of the NATO, we are part of the EU, we are not just by ourselves as we were a couple of times back in the history, you know, and and even like seeing the responses of, of our government, of the governments of the countries around us, and simply just all this together, plus of course the amazing help of the local people, I just calmed down and I said to myself that we will manage. I mean, Ukraine will manage with the help of all the countries and will be strong and even stronger. So mm. that's why I I don't feel afraid at all anymore. Yeah, I think that's very well said. And I think you made a really good point. I, there's a lot of gallows humor in this part of the world. And uh, if, if I make sort of a, a dark joke, it's that when I took people to Poland on a tour this year, the closest we got to a Russian tank was one that was parked in front of a museum. Uh, but the mm. fact is that that hints at something that Katka was just saying. This region is really very uh, comfortable with the idea, or at least they're used to the idea that they're kind of this buffer zone with Europe and Russia. There were invasions, actual Soviet tanks, Russian tanks rumbling through the streets in Budapest in 1956, in Prague in 1968, in Poland in 1981. Um, and so the people in this part of the world really understand what that means, and they understand what it means that they're part of NATO. Now, I, that's all kind of geopolitical reassurance, but you might be wondering what it's like to actually travel there I can tell you my experience. I led the first ever Rick Steves Poland tour that started in early May. And I had 20 people show up. And a lot of them told me on that first day, they said, I'm not, I wasn't so sure about coming here. I just felt reckless. I wondered if it was safe. I got to tell you, at the end of the tour, every last one of them unanimously said, we are so glad we came. Now that we've been here and we've we've actually been here and talked to the people and we all understand the situation, we realize what's terrible, it's terrible what's going on in Ukraine. It's uplifting what's happening in these neighboring countries to help all the refugees. But from a travel perspective, there was they sensed there was no risk to safety. There was no real danger. 
Um, and and they were so glad they had come. Katka, what's you've done? You did a lot of tours in these countries last year. What's your what's your impression? Uh, yes, I did, and actually, I had the very same experience as you had. You know, like a lot of my tour members were actually surprised not seeing the refugees. You know, like no refugee camps were built. They did not see any unrest uh, in the cities. You know, and. Uh, when I just told them that this is exactly because simply just the easiest thing what you could do that it was to open your home. And this is what many of the local people did just to help them to resettle, to kind of, you know, pause for a moment, think of the future. And uh, that's why you did not have to be worried at all for such things like that you will be maybe maybe the moral thing you know that you will be thinking can I go on vacation once they are in this trouble over there but that's actually a very crucial thing to 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 take it the other way around that actually by coming you can help the people you can help the local people you can help even the refugees themselves because many of them do work in our countries in hospitality business so basically mm -hmm. receptionists you know people in the restaurants drivers and all these people can be the people of the Ukraine. I think that's really beautiful what you said. And I had the same impression uh, when I was in Poland. There was something like 2 million Ukrainian refugees in Poland when I was there. And as a traveler who's not familiar with the culture, we didn't really notice them. And that doesn't mean they weren't there. They're hidden away. It's that they were had already kind of been blended into the society. And only when our Polish tour guides would point out to me and say, oh, do you see that poster by that building? They're saying that that building is temporary housing for refugees. Only then do you kind of realize and it's it's just very uplifting again sort of this solidarity that they have for Ukraine this is a sign from Poland that means solidarity with Ukraine and i really sense that in Poland and i sense it in the Czech Republic and the way that these people have have stepped up and i guess i just want to finish this topic by by introducing you to a good friend of mine in Krakow this is Andrew he's actually a driver he's been recommended in our Rick Steves guidebook for 15 years and every day of the year somebody using our book hires him to take him on a day trip out of Krakow and like a lot of people, he went through a really rough time for two years during COVID. He had very little business. And the beginning of 2020, he says, oh, great. Now we can finally recover. We can finally get back to doing what we love. We can finally recover some of our financial losses. And guess what? In February, here comes Putin into Ukraine. So poor Andrew spent another year last year working less than he wanted to. Um, and he has so much to share, such joy in his heart for Poland. And he's so beautiful, such a beautiful job of sharing it. Um, and it, it just kind of makes me sad. And you know what Andrew did during that time on the days he didn't have people to take around to Poland, he would drive supplies to the Ukrainian border and hand them off to trucks that could be taken deeper into Ukraine to help out the people there. And so I'm going to stop just short of making this a guilt trip. But in, in all honesty, I think what Katka said is very powerful. If you want to support Ukraine and support the people who are there for the Ukrainians as they're leaving their country and still I think feel very safe and and realistically not have any more danger than there are in a lot of other parts of Europe. It's you almost have a moral duty. I mean, this is I'm laying it on thick, but you almost have a moral duty to go to Poland and Czech Republic and Hungary and support those economies and support the well, I'll talk a little bit about this later, but a lot of the Ukrainian people are now working in the hospitality industry. So I would say it's it's not only um something not to be fearful of, it's something you can feel good about. Kaka, do you have any final thoughts about this? Yeah, I would just say that, yeah, the best thing what you can do is to come really just leave the worries at home, because as we are saying, you know, I've been living here through all this and then I don't feel any insecurity, uh, you know, it's safe. And uh, we would love to have you here because this way, as we said, we can all help. And together, we hope that we can, you know, manage all this and win. And you were showing me something very special that you uh, before we started. Do you want to share that? Yes, yes, very happy. You know, not even knowing uh, because, uh, of course, a lot of the cities you did see and your cities did the same thing that you had a lot of uh, meetings on the town square showing the support for the Ukrainian people. We also had many flags flying over, you know, the city in different windows of different institutions or just uh, like households, simple households like that. And one day we were planning to, uh, or planning, we knew that there was a, a big event happening on the Wenceslas Square. And my younger son, not, me not even knowing, all of a sudden came to me with this. Can you oh see my that? goodness, that's precious. And just said, mom, we need to go. So we mm -hmm. went. So we were at one of those big events at the square, Wenceslas Square, just very early March. It was actually very early after the attack. 
and it was visited by about 80,000 people. It was powerful. And it was like so, um, I mean, for me, you know, like thinking about my sons and all of a sudden he just by himself decided that I just make the poster and he did it. It was, wow, you know, amazing. Oh, that's such a wonderful story. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you for sharing that. And I've also been very inspired, especially in these countries that are so close to Ukraine, uh, hearing about the, 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 it's the outpouring, you see it everywhere, the outpouring of support, the outpouring of, of help. Uh, it's really very, very moving. So, well, thank you all for your patience in going through that. But we just wanted to address uh, some of what you might have as concerns if you're planning a trip pretty soon to, to these countries. Um, and, you know, honestly, the last thing that Kaka and I wanted to do was spend the first 10 minutes here talking about a, a terrible war going on in Ukraine, but we just thought it was very important to address in case you're curious and in case you're worried and to allay those fears and to give you more context. Uh, but we're really here tonight to celebrate these three countries, Czech Republic, Hungary, and Poland. And we're going to start now, kind of change gears and talk about all of the wonderful things, all the reasons you should be going to Prague right now. And when I sort of think through what do I love about Prague, well, for one thing, um, it's just incredibly well preserved. It's it's one of the one of the only big cities of Eastern Europe that wasn't damaged at all in the in the great wars of the 20th century. So when you walk around the streets of Prague, it's just incredible how well preserved the architecture is. You feel like you're walking, you know, walking through the streets of Prague is like flipping through the pages of an architecture handbook. And that really comes to a head here in the most beautiful public space in Prague, which is the Old Town Square. Uh, and it's it's busy all times of day and night. And you've got all these important landmarks like the famous astronomical clock and your tour guide or your guidebook can tell you what that's about. Um, but one of my favorite features of, of this Old Town Square is this statue of Jan Hus. And I want Kaka to tell us a little bit more about, about the great Czech Jan Hus. Okay, happy to share. Yes, some uh, uh, facts about his life. You know, he was one of the very important church reformator, but maybe not that well known in the English speaking world. But actually inspired by John Wycliffe, you know, of England, he lived in my country in the late 13, early 1400s, but he died for what he was criticizing. He was one of those very few who started to criticize the actual uh, practice of the Catholic Church. And especially he was very much against selling indulgences. At the same time, I think that he was um, in the inspiration for the two main very well-known fathers of Reformation, Luther and Calvin. And for us, like for Czechs, he was also very important to uh, the story of our language, you know, because maybe you know, but the Czech language is one of the Slavic languages. And he is one of those who added those diacritical marks we now use in our language. So back already in those days, he did those little, we call them in Czech, Háček, that's the little hook over some letters, and also Čárka, the little line over that. And thus he kind of laid the foundation of the modern, especially written form of my language. Mm, that's wonderful. And you know, I just would say as a tour guide and somebody who writes guidebooks, one of my great joys of introducing people to these countries is each of these countries has a dozen figures like Jan Hus, each very important, very unique, of course. But we don't get taught Czech history in American history classes, right? And you go to Italy or France and you're kind of familiar with some of the names. And for me, it's just a great joy and a great challenge to introduce people to figures like Jan Hus and to figure out who are the great important leaders in each of those cultures. Uh, and, and that's, that's I think, really a rewarding thing about going to Eastern Europe, where for a lot of people, it's kind of a clean slate. Uh, of course, from the old town of Prague, you have the beautiful and famous Charles Bridge, which crosses the Vltava River over towards Prague Castle. And once you get up to Prague Castle, by some measures, this is the biggest castle on earth. Uh, and it's a great place to do a little sightseeing and learn a little bit about Czech history. And uh, it's actually still used today. Katka, tell me about what's going to be happening in this room pretty soon. Wow, yeah, you have a beautiful picture of this room. This is, I would say, the most beautiful secular space within the Prague Castle complex. This is the so-called Vladislav Hall in the old royal palace. And when once we are like looking at this right now, yes, we are very much uh, aware of the things that are just happening now. You know, we just went through the first round of the presidential elections. This year it is or it has been pretty dramatic. And I just so much hope that in two weeks time, when we do the second round, that the dignity, the politeness, the uh, respect and truth will win over the hate, over lies, over populism, what we can just now, you know, see what's happening in my country. I know that it is maybe not such a big deal, 
the presidential elections in my country as it is in America, because we also have the prime minister in my country. But for this very time, I just can't believe, you know, even my sons, everybody is watching the news, what's happening now, how we are all preparing for the second round. And we just hope and please wish us good. And we hope and fingers crossed that it will come out well, because this very room will be the room where the new president will be inaugurated. So that's how it is used in these days, mostly. Yeah, this and this is a common story. I think I've heard this story in a lot of different countries around Europe. And uh, again, just like each country has its own historical figures like Jan Hus, each country also has its own contemporary political figures. And one of the joys, again, of traveling to a place you're not, not too familiar with is you really get to know some of the nuances of local politics. That's another a great feature of, of traveling in these places. Now, the centerpiece of Prague Castle is St. Vitus Cathedral, which is the, the most important church in the country. And inside, there's all sorts of fascinating little details and artifacts. But when I'm in St. Vitus Cathedral, I can't not focus on this amazing stained glass window, which is by a very special and very important Czech artist. And I want Kaka to tell us a little bit about, about this window and about the artist. Yes, very happy to tell you a few words about it, because it's also, uh, I would say, one of the most beautiful windows, if not the most beautiful. Uh, this one was painted, so it is actually a painting on the window in 1924 by Alphonse Mucha, whom you may know either as Mucha, maybe Mucha, but he was Czech. Some people even called him Le Mucha, because he actually gained his recognition in France, especially when portraying Sarah Bernhardt the very well-known actress of that time. But this very window depicts actually very nicely the story of religion in my country. And here we have the close-up of the central part of the window where you can see the most important saint of my country. But before he became saint, he was also the very important king of my country, but here only depicted as a boy sitting next to his granny. So this boy in this right, uh, a bright red clothing, that's good King Wenceslas, as you know him, but we know him as Svati Václav and his grandmother sang Ludmilla. Mm, that's beautiful. And you this... can actually also see the sketch for this window in the Mucha Museum, what we have in the downtown area. So if you're interested in his art, as I think that it is amazing uh, and very pleasing style. You know, you don't have to be a real expert on, on art, but this is just so nice to look at. You can visit also this museum where you will find, of course, not just the sketch of this window, but also he designed the first banknotes of the country, the first stamps, you know, we had as Czechoslovakia, the free democratic country. He also did a lot of jewelry design, fabric design and all that. And also you will learn about his masterpiece. The and this is the guy we're talking about, Alphonse Mucha. Mm -hmm. And I agree, Rick, Rick uh, describes in our guidebook, he describes the artwork of Alphonse Mucha as insistently likable. And I think that's a good way to describe it. Just these really beautiful Art Nouveau, just kind of flowing forms and uh, something really special. So yes, I think in addition to that window, if people are in Prague, they should make sure to seek out the Alphonse Mucha Museum over in the New Town. That's a great, great suggestion. Another thing that I think people associate with the Czech Republic and Prague, and rightly so, you guys have a wonderful tradition of beer. So tell me, tell me a little bit about the 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 importance of beer in the Czech culture. It is hard to say a little because it is really so important in our culture. I mean, according to some statistics, just to give you some numbers, you know, I was just checking it again if we are still on the first place, but we are that we are considered to be the biggest beer drinkers per capita though, okay? So not like the total consumption as we are not a big country, we have just about 10 and a half million, well, plus now 47,000 Ukrainians and they're surely helping us now once they are here. But uh, just to give you an idea, they say that we drink about 180 liters of beer a year, what actually makes 360 glasses. So, I would say that maybe we kind of change this one quote or saying that maybe one beer a day keeps the doctor away. Do you say this in English like that? <laughs> yeah, we say something like that, except not, not for beer. But I think, yeah, in, in Prague so, that and, makes sense. But, but what is also very important, you know, it is not about drinking. It's actually about meeting people. Because mm -hmm. in my country, it is always to go to the beer hall with somebody, you know, on a way from work, you usually can stop for one or two maybe. So it is a very like important socializing thing. It's not that we drink, you know, the beer bottles on our sofas back home. That's not the point. To get that fresh, you know, to join 
your friends and this is this is what is important absolutely this is this beautiful picture by the way is uh one of our group dinners on the on the eastern europe tour and i one inch there's a lot of little customs around czech beer and i think one thing that surprises people sometimes katka tell me if this is right at a traditional czech beer hall if they notice that you've stopped you finished your beer they don't ask you do you want another one they'll just as soon as you're down to this much another one will just you have to say stop i don't need more beer right the default yes, is to keep going is that right? right that's exactly correct and then also sometimes when we are ordering beer you know that because we start counting by or with thumb we show like one two three this way and if you show this we bring you two right away sometimes because ah, we, okay. we missed your thumb but i think it's just fine you know it's nothing <laughs> nothing bad you can easily do two beers. Very good. Okay. Um, well, another thing that's worth uh, talking about in Prague, uh, Prague is one of many cities in this part of Europe that has a very important Jewish heritage. And uh, we'll talk a little bit, a lot more about that actually in Poland. Uh, but here in Prague, they have a particularly well-presented Jewish quarter where you can see old synagogues. This is the oldest synagogue in Prague. And you can see other different kinds, different styles of synagogues. And there's also a very evocative old Jewish uh, cemetery. But the reason that this is all so well preserved and so well presented, there's sort of a sinister history to it. Kaka, tell us, tell us why Prague's Jewish Quarter is so outstanding. Yeah, you know, if you if you decide to come to Prague, you can actually learn a lot about uh, Judaism of this central eastern part of Europe, because also we have one of the biggest museums as a museum. I mean, it was already established back in 1906. But then once the Nazis invaded my country, according to what we know, that those people who worked in that museum, they were still allowed to continue their work of preservation, you know, of the artifacts and so, but we are pretty much sure that the Nazis has very, uh, have uh, had very different intention, you know, behind it. And that is what later uh, came out or was known as uh, the fact that they were about to build or establish in our Jewish quarter in Prague, a museum, what they called the museum of the extinct race. I know it's very hard to take it in once you hear it for the first time, but this is actually the reason why that it was not destroyed and all that, why we have now the oldest active synagogue, the one you, you uh, saw the picture earlier uh, of, and that's the old new synagogue, what was built in late 1200s, and it's still standing almost untouched. And the same here with the picture of the old cemetery from the 1400s, and we have it in the middle of the city, pretty well preserved. So oh. because of this very, uh, I mean, crazy idea what the Nazis had. Yeah, that's a very powerful history. And there's a there's almost a poetic justice now that people flock to Prague to learn about the the, the Jewish heritage and culture here. Um, and of course, the Jewish heritage and culture is still thriving, um, uh, which is all because the Nazis thought this would be a great thing to preserve. Um, wow, that's there's a lot of that kind of heavy layering of history in these countries. That's that's just makes traveling here so poignant, I think. Um, we've talked about the new town a couple of times in Prague. A lot of people get fixated on the old town and the historic stuff and the beautiful, well-preserved old buildings. But there's also a thriving new town. And this is the main, you know, I think of it as a, a boulevard, but they call it a square. This is Wenceslas Square, which is the heart of the new town in Prague, really kind of the heart of the modern city of Prague. Um, and the statue on top, Katka already told us about the good king Wenceslas, which is, uh, it goes by the name Václav in, in Czech. And he's kind of surveying the square. Now, one thing I love about this square is it's sort of the stage upon which a lot of Czech history has played out. And each of these countries has their own different story about how they weathered the communist period, which ended began around the end of World War II, all the way through about 1989 in most of these places. Um, th that communist period where they were part of the Soviet Union satellite, each one had their own experience. And specifically, each one had a different way that they ended communism. And I find the story here in Prague particularly moving. And that was over the course of many days, a series of small demonstrations that just started as basically students, an impromptu demonstration by students who just showed up on Wenceslas Square and were beaten by police. Well, the next day, the students, parents and teachers and friends came out for a slightly larger demonstration. And then each day, the demonstrations got larger and larger and larger. And over the course, Kaka can tell us, I think it was about 10 days, suddenly there's hundreds of thousands of people filling Wenceslas Square. And Václav Havel, who was this beloved sort of philosopher and a playwright and a poet who'd been imprisoned by the communist regime, suddenly emerged. He ended up uh, going on to become the first post-communist president of Czechoslovakia. 
Um, and after this series of pre giant peaceful demonstrations, basically the Czechoslovak uh, parliament of communist Czechoslovakia voted itself out of existence and said communism is over here. They called it the, Rev the Velvet Revolution because it all happened without firing a shot. And uh, for me, that just gives me goosebumps to be on this place and to think about it. But the, the, the joy of having a wonderful tour guide like Katka, she can tell us as an eyewitness what actually happened. Katka, tell us what it was. Were you living in Prague when this was happening? You must have been quite young. I was actually quite young and I did not live in Prague, but I was just coming to this square one day. And, uh, you know, it was even coincidence in my life, but I was born in November, not really on the 17th of November when we started or when the students started this uh, revolution. But I just happened to be there at the time of my uh, birthday. So I think that I can say since then that I've had the biggest birthday party ever when coming <laughs> to this square with maybe like 250,000 people already there. So we even could not fit easily. And, you know, whenever I look at this crowd of people, First thing what I always have in my mind is how much we treasure our freedom, because uh, you you can see easily how you can lose it, you know, that even with the like blink of an eye, you know, all of a sudden it's all gone. So we very much understand that it is not for granted and we will always treasure it as the biggest treasure. And that's something as a traveler that you really feel and the I can't describe to you the joy of talking to people like Katka. And it's interesting, in a lot of countries, the, the history that we hear about happened hundreds of years ago, but some of the most dramatic and most moving chapters of the history of these countries have taken place in our own lifetimes. And it's just a privilege to be able to go and travel and talk to people like Katka and hear their personal experiences. You know, imagine having your birthday on this square full of 250,000 of your compatriots demanding the end of a stifling communist system and, and the creation of a, a new democratic country. I mean, it's, it's, this is the stuff, this is what keeps me coming back for sure. So thank you for sharing that, Katka. That's, that's beautiful. Um, we're going to be moving on. We've, like I said, we've got three countries to cover. So we're just doing a little bit of each one, give you a taste. Uh, but we are going to be moving on to the next country. But first, I wanted to mention so many travelers, I would say, Katka, you probably know 90, 95% of people who come to the country of the Czech Republic only go to Prague. Do you know what the number is off the top of your head? I don't know the number, but you are right that it's, many, because it's also like just the first visit for many of you. So then this is, of course, very understandable. But still, yeah, so, there are a couple of these countryside trips. <laughs> yeah, it's something like that. But um, it's a shame. And it's understandable. But it's a shame because there's so much more to these countries than the capital city. And so I would say if you're, if you're thinking about going to one place in Czech Republic other than Prague, it's a beautiful city down in the southern part of the country called Chesky Krumlov. That's the picture you're looking at here. In fact, we have a tour that goes Berlin, Berlin, Prague, Vienna, and the Rick Steves Berlin, Prague, Vienna tour actually spends a night in this beautiful town. And it's just always good, I think, to get a small town contrast to the big, busy capital city. And Chesky Krumlov is just a beautiful small city, and it's got a, a strollable center and a colorful castle in the middle. But that's just the beginning. Again, I wish we could go on and on about all the great Czech towns. There's so many interesting Czech towns and villages. This is a beautiful kind of a storybook village called Stromberg. And we go here on our Eastern Europe tour for lunch on our way out of the country heading towards uh, Poland. We stop off for lunch here in the town of Stromberg. And I've had a, a joyous experience of driving around in the Czech Republic for 10 days at a time and stopping in, in all these towns and villages. And I have to just tell you, you could, I think you could spend two weeks in Czech Republic and never go to Prague and still have a wonderful trip. So don't look past, especially if you have a little time, don't look past these other small, small joys. Um, but it is time for us to move on because we've got a lot of ground to cover. So we're going to cross our first border and head next to Hungary. Now, when I think about Hungary, the first thing I think about, and again, I talked earlier about how there's a tendency, I think, for Americans to mush all these countries together. And we think, well, they're all kind of variations on the same thing. They're very similar. The fact is, Hungary is completely, entirely different from all these other countries in terms of its history, its language, its cuisine, its climate. It's south of the Carpathian Mountains, so it has a warmer climate than what we've been talking about. And a lot of that has to do with the people who originally came to Hungary back around the year 896, they think. Okay, so the late ninth century. And that are the Magyars, or as they say in their own language, the Magyars. And basically the Magyars, this is a little hard to follow, but the Magyars are a nomadic tribe that came from the steppes of Central Asia. So on your mental map, you think that's kind of near Mongolia. And they kind of marauded their way across and ended up here in what's today Hungary. And they decided 
I think we're going to stick around here and build a civilization and build a city. And so today's Hungarians, to some extent, are descended from this original Central Asian tribe, the Magyars. This is one of the oldest surviving sculptures of the Magyar people. And you can see it way back when they actually looked a little bit different. Um, to this to this day, what's interesting is they've mixed in with all of their European neighbors. So you couldn't necessarily pick a Hungarian out of a lineup. But the culture is still quite different and the language is extremely different. This is sort of the heritage of the Magyars. Uh, so, for example, in Hungary, they put the first name last, which is what happens in a lot of other Asian languages. So we think about the composer uh, Franz Liszt, who's actually Hungarian. In Hungary, he would be called uh, Liszt Ferenc. They put the, the last name first. OK, another example is you'll notice when we say the name of the capital city of Hungary, we say Budapest, Budapest even though it's just an S. Well, that's because in the Hungarian language, an S by itself is pronounced like a SH, and an SZ is how you get an S sound. And so I, I wanted to illustrate this and also give you a little language lesson. So Katka and I are going to teach you three different words in these three languages, Czech, Polish, and Hungarian. And this is a good chance for you to hear the languages. It's also a chance for you to just see how different Hungarian is from the other uh, languages in this area. So Katka is going to do the Czech and the Polish, and I'll do the Hungarian. And we're going to start with hello. Yes. All right. <clears throat> dobrý den. Dzień dobry. Jo napotkivanok. <laughs> so you hear the difference. Dobry means good. Den means day. So the Czechs say dobry den, good day. The Polish say it the same. They just reverse it. Dzień dobry. Hungarians say yo napot kivanok, which means I wish you a good day. Very, very different sound to it. Okay, let's do thank you. For thank you. Oh, you have it the other way around, but that's okay. Oh, yeah. For Czech, <laughs> oh, I've, I mixed up the languages. This is my mistake. Right. <laughs> that's how, how close uh, these are, you know, the Czech and Polish. So in Czech, it is dziękuję. In Polish, it is dziękuję. And in Hungarian, it's kosonom. And then finally, let's do cheers, and a, a very important word when you're traveling. Very important. So in Czech, as you know already, na zdraví, in Polish, na zdrowie. In Hungarian, egeshegedre. So that's just to illustrate the, the difference in the sound. And when you're traveling in Hungary, it's fun to kind of tune into how those differences trickle down to the culture as well. Um, now, we're going to talk mainly about the big city of uh, the capital city of Hungary, which is Budapest. And when I think about what I love about Budapest and what's striking about it, it's just an incredibly grand city, okay? It's straddling the Danube River and it has some of the most incredible monumental buildings you'll see anywhere. So you've got, for example, the Hungarian Parliament Building, you cross the landmark Chain Bridge, which is a famous landmark in the city. And on the other side of the Chain Bridge, you have the castle, uh, Buda Castle, which is on the, on the other side of the river, which itself has some incredible landmarks and monuments. And then from the castle, you can kind of look out and get a sense of the lay of the land of Budapest, which is it's really two cities. Actually, historically, it used to be two cities, which eventually merged into one. On this side of the river where the castle is, was the city called Buda, and that's very hilly and very historic. And then across the river, the very flat part of the city was Pest. It used to be just Pest, and now it's half of Budapest. And that's really where a lot of the sightseeing is, uh, other than the castle. Most of the time you're going to spend on the, the Pest side of the river. Here again, again, just this is a city that's built on an incredible monumental scale. You have the Hero Square, which celebrates all the historical Hungarians, starting with those Magyars who arrived here back in the year 896. You have a beautiful park with incredible kind of uh, party favors from a big party they threw that year. Uh, one of the most beautiful opera houses. There's something Katka almost imperial about Budapest. Can you tell us a little bit why Budapest is so kind of over the top? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly when you uh, go into this opera building. But actually, when you see many of the buildings from the outside too, you will actually see that this is very different from Krakow, from Prague, from one simple reason. First of all, this part of Budapest was pretty heavily damaged by flood in about like 1840s. But more importantly, as you all know, uh, Budapest became to be like the second most important city of the empire, what later got that name, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. This is what happened in 1867. And actually to see the boom of building, of constructing, just in between about this 1850 to maybe 1910 was just amazing. Also in number of people, you know, I think that it was about like maybe 100,000 people living in Budapest just at that time of around 1850, but at the beginning of the 20th century, 
it was one million people. So all these grand looking buildings, big boulevards also uh, very much resemble some of the Viennese because it was also one of the rivalry towns. Actually, Vienna was more or less the model city for a lot of these uh, buildings, like including the opera. And according to many art historians, it was actually said that this one in Budapest became to be even grander or bigger or even more modern than the one in Vienna, what of course was not meant to be. And uh, the uh, emperor, Franz Joseph, when he commissioned this building to be built, and he actually paid the money for that, but probably was not that much recognized for his efforts. When uh, the grand opening of this building was happening, he just said two simple sentences to it. But I think that he also reflected like how unhappy we, he was to see that this building was even bigger, grander, most beautiful, or more beautiful than the one in Vienna. So his response was just simple. Oh, it's beautiful building. Oh, I like it a lot. <laughs> and that was all <laughs> what he said. Yeah, I think that explains a lot. So this Budapest is a boom town, and it really boomed in the late 19th century. And it, it was exactly the same time that it became the co-capital of what had been the Austrian Empire or the Habsburg Empire, this became the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So it was sort of the, the, the dual monarchy, the two capitals. And they sort of were making up for lost time to establish themselves as this great uh, imperial city, this imperial capital. And so you've got this amazing opera house. This is the interior of that opera house. A great sightseeing thing to do, by the way. You can take a tour. Even if you don't want to attend a whole opera, you can take a tour of the opera house interior. I mean, they also have other amazing musical. There's a great classical music tradition here. Again, a lot of this you can tell kind of came from Vienna. There's a lot of similarities there. Another similarity with Vienna, this looks like another fancy opera house. This is a coffee house actually. And just like Vienna, there's a really thriving and, and a beautiful coffee culture in Budapest. Some of the grandest coffee houses and cafes you will find anywhere in Europe are right here in Budapest. This is the New York Cafe, one of the greatest coffee houses in the world in terms of the decor. Um, so that sort of gives the, a sense of why Budapest is so grand. It's also just a great city to explore and poke around. Around that same time in the late 19th century, they build a bunch of market halls around the city. And stepping into one of these market halls, this is the Great Market Hall, as it's called, is a good chance to browse and learn a little, little bit about Hungarian cuisine. And when you travel in these countries, you notice one of the things that's extremely different from country to country is the cooking. And one thing that people associate with Hungarian cooking is the warm weather peppers and tomatoes and bright flavors Specifically, paprika is something that comes up a lot in Hungarian cooking. And I try not to play favorites, but I have to say of all of these countries, and frankly, of most of Europe, Hungarian cuisine is one of my favorite cuisines. I think it's right up there with French or Italian cuisine. Certainly, it's the most underrated cuisine in Europe. It's absolutely delicious. Katka, I know not to be competitive with the Czechs, but I know you also really appreciate Hungarian cuisine. What do you think of it? Yes, I, I surely do. Of course, you know that sometimes we don't know because we live together that who really studied what, but this is pretty clear. When something has got paprika in it, this is not Czechs who invented it. This is Hungarians. And I very much love the flavors. I very much love the colors too. I actually make a lot of the Hungarian dishes at the beginning, I even did not know that they come from Hungary. One of those, like paprikash, for example, it's one of the most popular in my family. And so, so then I would say that, yes, exactly. Maybe you don't know much about that cuisine, but I'm sure that if you come and you will just taste it, you will you will say that it is another kind of uh, this foodie place, you know, but you can enjoy a lot because I'm, it's I think full of food. That's well said. I think Budapest is a great foodie destination. So there's great traditional Hungarian cooking. It tends to be really meaty and just loaded with flavor. One of the most famous traditional Hungarian dishes is something that we might call goulash. And what's interesting is that when you think of goulash and you see this picture, you might say, that's not goulash. Goulash is like a heavy, thick brown stew. Well, actually, in other countries like the Czech Republic and like Germany, Goulash has been sort of reinterpreted, but the original goulash is, comes from a Hungarian word that's guyash levesh, which means shepherd soup. And this was basically a dish that could be prepared simply by shepherds at the end of a long day in a big kettle over an open fire. And it's basically just a thin broth with lots of paprika. So you get that bright red flavor and chunks of meat and potatoes. And then it kind of turned into what other countries call goulash. So if you go to Budapest and you get a plate of goulash, you might be surprised it's not quite what you think it is, but this is the original Guyash Levesh soup. Uh, there's also wonderful modern 
contemporary dining in Budapest. I love restaurants that take traditional Hungarian food and they present it in an innovated, innovative, elevated, fresh new way. Uh, I just think for me, Budapest is one of the great food cities of Europe. I just, I never get tired of trying new restaurants there. Obviously not just Hungarian food. There's a lot of great international food as well, but Hungarian food is really worth getting excited about if you're going to be traveling here. In fact, on one of our Rick Steve's tours, it's the Prague Budapest tour. We do a cooking class in Budapest. We think it's really important for people not just to try the Hungarian food, but actually learn how to make it because it's so special. Now, if I had to pick one sort of quintessential Hungarian activity, if you're going to go to Hungary for any amount of time and you want to do one thing, I think this is a must, and that is taking advantage of its incredible thermal baths. There are something like 125 different thermal bath complexes around Hungary. There's something like two dozen just in Budapest alone. This is one of my favorites. It's called the Sechenyi Baths. And I think for telling people, especially American travelers who might be skittish to go to a swimming pool or a thermal bath, it might make them nervous. They might think, well, do I have to walk around naked wearing a towel? There are different kinds of baths, but for most of them, yes, you can wear your swimsuit. And actually, once you're in the bath, what's wonderful about the Hungarian bath system is it's very accessible. It's very um, easy to enjoy. And at the end of the day, it's basically like going to your hometown swimming pool with three big differences. One, the water is 100 degrees. Two, you're surrounded by stunning architecture. And three, most of the people swimming with you are pot-bellied, speedo-clad Hungarians. Um, so it's a cultural experience as well as being relaxing and fun. And I got to tell you, I cannot go to Hungary or go to Budapest without spending. I tried to keep it to just one a day, but it's really hard to resist going and enjoying the various thermal bath complexes in Budapest. Here at Sechenyi, I can stand under this geyser and just feel it pounding against the back of my shoulders all day long. And it's very local. Now, some of these are becoming a little more touristy, but most of the clientele at a lot of these baths are still Hungarians. In fact, Katka, they're not just here for, I'm there for fun and you're there for fun, but the Hungarians go for other reasons, don't they? That's correct. Yeah, it's, I mean, a great experience for everybody. If you come as a visitor, you can enjoy, as the locals enjoy, playing chess here. Or we women often exchange the recipes, you know, for either cooking or baking strudels or whatever, sitting in that hot pool, not swimming uh, in those you don't swim. And we often do it as a group activity or just, you know, on our own. But if you are a local person, this is an amazing thing that your doctor can even prescribe you to go there on either way, weekly or daily basis or a monthly couple of times, you know, for your own benefits. And this is all covered by the national healthcare system. So this is pretty amazing thing what they have. So you're telling me that I can go to my doctor and get a prescription to go sit in a pool of hot water and then get a massage and it's part of the healthcare system. Yes, and if you become the hon honorary Hungarian, you can go right away. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so between so the it's nothing touristy, yeah, in that way, <laughs> you know. Between the coffee culture, the opera, and the, all the great classical music, the amazing food, and now you're telling me that you can go sit in a, hot, a basically a giant hot tub and call it a medical treatment. I think the Hungarians have some things figured out here that we should probably catch up to. Yeah, this. These are these are all reasons why this is a wonderful country to visit. Um, so again, I it's it's one thing I love to do. By the way, if I'm in town, either leading a tour or updating my guidebook, I love to kind of plan my day so I end. If I'm working hard, updating my guidebook, running around, checking all the hotels, I love to finish my day at the doorstep of one of these baths. This is Sechenyi Bath, so that when I'm done with work, I literally just have to go in and put on my swimsuit. And I there's no better way to unwind after a busy day than this. And by the way, I keep showing you this one Sechenyi Bath. There's so many other great baths that we describe in our guidebooks. There's the Gellert bath, which is a little bit more of like an upscale spa-like experience. Um, and there's actually one called Rudash baths. And the, there's a, a great modern complex there. But the core of it is, is like a 500-year-old, basically an Ottoman bath that they've, that they've, back when this was an area that was controlled by the Ottomans, uh, that they've kind of restored. So you really feel the history in this particular bath called Rudash, Rudash baths. Uh, well, again, we've got a lot of ground to cover, so we're going to head out of Budapest, and soon we're heading out of Hungary. But first, I'm going to make the same point here that I did when we were talking about Czech Republic. There's a lot more to Hungary than just Budapest. There's lots of wonderful smaller cities and small towns. One of our favorites, this is actually a stop on our Eastern Europe tour, is a town called Eger. Um, and this is just a really small, enjoyable county seat town. It's about an hour and a half, two hours outside of Budapest. Lots of beautiful monumental buildings. 
and a very charming main square. And we find it's also the, the heart of a very important wine growing region. Um, so we find, and whether we're on a tour or whether I'm traveling on my own, I find Eger is a great place to just kind of unwind, kind of relax from the big city and also just get a taste of small town Hungary. I think it's it's really a special place. All right, we are heading into the third of our trio of great countries of Central slash Eastern Europe, and that is Poland. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we're especially jazzed about Poland right now because we just finished our very successful first season of our brand new Best of Poland in 10 Days Tour. This is the group from the very first uh, Poland tour that I was fortunate enough to lead along with a team of great guides back in May. Um, and so in thinking about having just been there, it, it kind of renewed my uh, excitement about Poland, which I feel very strongly about. I was thinking about what are some of the things that I love about Poland? What are some of the things you might love about Poland? Well, one thing I think that's really cool about Poland is there are lots and lots of Polish Americans. Um, this is a wonderful woman who went on that first tour. And on that tour, we had about 20 tour members. And I asked them all what their interests were. About half of them had Polish ancestry. And by the way, I also have Polish ancestry. I'm, I'm one quarter Dombrowski. My family comes from near Krakow, that part of the family. Uh, I think something like 10 million Americans have Polish ancestry. So some of you watching at home might be kind of intrigued about going to Poland. And we found that this tour is designed to be the perfect kind of first trip to Poland or maybe first trip back to Poland in a long time um, to sort of connect all those dots. And whether you're going on a tour or not, uh, I find that that's a big draw for a lot of people, reconnecting with their Polish roots. Another thing that I think is distinctive about Poland compared to some of these other countries, it's a very religious country. Specifically, it's a very Catholic country. So there's lots of beautiful churches everywhere you go. And it's just really touching, actually, to step inside some of these churches and, and really kind of uh, learn about uh, that the importance of that to the Polish people. And I'm curious, Katka, when I go to Prague or Czech Republic, I don't sense that the religion, the Catholicism is quite such an important part of life. How do you how do you find as a Czech person coming to Poland? Yes, yes, you're exactly right. You know, this is actually pretty amazing to see how the faith uh, unites the Polish people. And thinking of like coming like me, coming from a uh, also former communist country like Poland was, that they've kept it much stronger than we did. But of course, you know, we just cannot look at this one chapter of our history, why it was that and why it is different in, in Poland. But this is actually why I think it is great for you to come because this way we can go a little more into details, you know, like what formed us, what or who formed us, why we are more similar or maybe a little more different than you would think, you know, as countries, as nations of the different countries of this uh, particular region. So we will not have time to tell you right now, but I'm just, uh, what I'm trying to, to tell you that if you come, we can, you know, look at this a little bit from the like bigger context, because it is just not that easy to say that we were a communist country. That's why we did not keep our beliefs that much, because there is much more uh, uh, like, stories about and behind it. Yeah, it's very complicated. But I think one thing I, I've learned a lot about in Poland is under communism, being Catholic and going to church became a way of uh, expressing your discontent with the regime. And so the, that wasn't the case as much in other countries. But in Poland, sort of being very active in your church in some ways was almost making you a political operative in a way. So it's 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 really, yeah, it's really interesting to tease out the differences in the different countries. Um, we've talked a little bit about Hungarian food, and we've talked about how Czech Republic is beer country. Here in uh, Poland, of course, vodka is a very popular drink. And in terms of the food in Poland, as it, you know, Hungary was kind of a warm weather climate that had a lot of spices and hot, warm flavors. Poland is a very cold weather country. So when you think about Polish food, you think about things like sausage here in the US, we actually just talk about Polish sausage. There's a reason for that. Um, that's a, the, a good way to sort of preserve meats through a long, hard, cold winter. Um, another thing you might think about when you think of Poland is uh, borscht. And borscht is a fantastic soup. Just like I seek out a thermal bath every day that I'm in Hungary, I seek out a borscht every day that I'm in Poland because uh, each one is a little bit different. But this is this really delicious, savory red beet soup that is just uh, on a cold day in Poland, nothing tastes better than that. But like these other countries, there's also a lot of uh, updated, upmarket, traditional Polish food and lots of international influences as well. So I find increasingly Poland's also just a really fun and varied place to go out to eat. Um, now, the main city in Poland, if you're going to go to one place in Poland, a lot of people would go to this place for good reason. This is Krakow, which is sort of the historic capital. It's the university center. It's down in the southern part of the country. 
And one reason people love Krakow is because it has an absolutely spectacular main market square. I mean, for my money, this is one of the most beautiful squares anywhere in Europe. And uh, Katka, tell me, you love to bring your groups into this square. And uh, what, what's their impression when they walk into the main market square in Krakow? Yes, I surely do, because, you know, it is it, it is really a wow moment for many of my tour members when we come there, because we usually enter the square through one of those tiny streets, and all of a sudden, this huge thing is in front of you. The square is actually considered to be the biggest medieval market square. I think the length is something like 200 meters, you know, one side, so it's really big. And I also heard from my tour members sometimes uh, the comments that it very much looks like the St. Mark's Square, you know, in Venice, but of course in a smaller scale, but just the gondolas are missing. And this is probably <laughs> what refers to the beautiful Renaissance architecture, which you can find around like the Quad Hall and the other buildings around. And I do very much remember this square also from uh, the past. I mean, from communism, we could not travel much, but still I did make it few times, only few times to Poland. And I do remember this square to be completely without life, you know. Also, the buildings were much grayer. Now they are so beautifully restored. And especially to see the life, you know, like here you have also the picture of a lot of these outdoor cafes. And that is a huge change, you know, from what I remember. Yeah, it's just this is such a delightful place to spend time when you're in Krakow. It's it's hard to stay away. When I'm in Krakow, I, I find myself fabricating excuses to walk through the square just to have that experience because it's it, you never get tired of it. It's just great. Uh, Krakow also is just a beautiful and very compact. The old town of Krakow is a very compact and easy place to explore. It's the kind of place that invites just wandering around. There's a beautiful green belt, a park that surrounds the old town with lots of benches and people out on their bikes and open air cafes. The main sightseeing attraction in Krakow is Wawel Hill. Wawel Hill is at the southern tip of the old town, just a 10 minute walk from the main market square. This is the traditional seat of the Polish kings. Krakow was actually the capital of Poland until about 500 years ago when it moved to Warsaw. So you can learn about Polish history here. It's also the site of uh, Wawel Cathedral, which is the most important Catholic church in this very Catholic country. Now, um, the other part of, I mentioned a lot about the Catholicism in Poland, but there's something else that's very, very important in Polish history, and that is Judaism. This was traditionally the home of a lot of Jewish people, millions of Jewish people, partly because there were some medieval kings uh, in the early days of Poland that were much more tolerant than other countries and invited Jewish people to settle here. Um, and so Krakow is one good place to learn about that history. There's a neighborhood, it's about a 30 minute, 20 minute walk or a very quick tram or taxi ride from the old town. It's called Kazimierz, and this is the heart of the Jewish heritage of Krakow. And if you know anything about this, it's because this was the place where the events of Schindler's List took place. And it's also where Steven Spielberg filmed the movie Schindler's List. Um, and actually, when Steven Spielberg filmed Schindler's List here, it kind of rejuvenated interest in this part of the city. It had kind of been forgotten, and a lot of that Jewish history had been swept under the rug. And now, over the last 10, 20 years, there are so many opportunities to learn about Polish Jewish history here in Kazimierz. They've reopened a lot of the synagogues. There's some great museums. Um, and there's cemeteries as well. And it was really, it's an interesting contrast because you remember in Prague, we saw how well preserved the cemeteries were. And that was intentional because the Nazis wanted to preserve that as sort of a museum. Well, it's the opposite here in Kazimierz. The Nazis came in with their tanks and very vengefully, they actually rode their tanks through the cemeteries and tore them up. There are still a few that are still standing, but there's also a lot of places where you can see all of the cracked and broken headstones that have now been assembled into memorials. Um, so learning about the Jewish history, Kazimierz in the uh, city of Krakow is a great place to do that. Um, now, of course, the most tragic chapter of that history came during World War II, during the Holocaust. And just about an hour and a half outside of Krakow is Auschwitz-Birkenau, which is the most notorious concentration camp in the Nazi system. And a lot of people come here from Krakow. It's almost a place of pilgrimage. And you see all of these landmarks. For example, you walk under the gate that says Arbeit macht frei which was just this cruelly sarcastic message, work will set you free, which of course was a terrible lie and, and just kind of a, a really cruel joke against the inmates here. Um, there are two parts to Auschwitz-Birkenau. Auschwitz I was originally a Polish military barracks, and those buildings have now been filled with some just fascinating and really wrenching museums. So this is where you get to learn about this period of the history, and you actually get to see actual piles of suitcases that were taken from people just before they were sent to the gas chambers. And then a very short bus ride away is the second part of the camp, which is also called Birkenau. And this is basically custom built by the Nazis 
as a factory for the mass production of death. And it's just horrifying to walk around these grounds and see the scale of what the Nazis had planned. It's an incredibly powerful visit to, for example, stand in the middle of this train platform. And a lot of people know this terrible story where Nazi doctors would stand here as people were unloaded and they would point one direction, which meant that the people would be sent directly to the gas chamber. And if they pointed the other direction, they would be kept alive for at least a little bit longer to be put to work here at Auschwitz-Birkenau. Um, this is a very important site. Uh, like I said, it's a place of pilgrimage for a lot of people. Uh, we take people here on our Eastern Europe tour, of course. And I'm just curious from Kotka's point of view, as someone who takes people, takes groups to, Kotka, uh, to Auschwitz quite a bit, uh, how do you think it fits into, into a trip to, to this part of the world? And how do your tour members take it? Yeah, yes, I know that, of course, you know, many of us think like, why I should go to such a place while, while I'm on vacation. But I think that it is very important. I mean, even even maybe more important in these days when we have less and less survivors, you know, due to their age. And then I think that uh, the, the only little thing we can do for them and for the fact that we will still spread the message is to visit the place, no matter, of course, how difficult it can be. And we understand, you know, our personal approaches to such places can be very different. But uh, we we simply think that at least once in your lifetime, if you can, of course, nobody is ever forcing anybody, but if you can visit such a place, it will have an impact for uh, on the future world. And that's why we do take groups there. We do have some discussions later on if people want to have it. You know, there are very well uh, educated guides who will really bring this topic uh, in a very good manner to everybody. So I would, even though, of course, I can understand that there are some worries of people, I would surely recommend visiting such a place like Auschwitz is. Yeah, I think that's very well said. I've I've taken a lot of groups here as well, and I I think it's safe to say most people are, are at least have some trepidation about going because they know it's going to be a very emotional experience. But almost unanimously afterwards, people say, I just, I feel like it was so important for me to see that, to bear witness to that. And it, it gives you an understanding and context um, of this just terrible chapter in history. So, yeah. Okay, very good. So, um, so uh, we're going to change gears here. And just to finish up, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about the rest of Poland. So we've talked about Krakow, which is there in the southern part of the country. Uh, and Auschwitz, which is very nearby there. And for many years, we would take people on those on our Eastern Europe tours to those places. And people kept saying to us, well, we wish we could see more of Poland. They would just fall in love with Krakow. You saw how beautiful it is and say, I wish we could see more of Poland. We just, we wanna go beyond that. And so a few years ago, right around the time the pandemic started, we planned this new Best of Poland in 10 Days tour. And after a, a long delay, earlier this May, we finally started to do it. So I'd like to take this time, not just to talk about the tour, but to talk about other places in Poland that you might like to go beyond Krakow. I think this is a huge country. It's almost 40 million people. It's quite a bit bigger than the other two that we're talking about. And I think there's even more to it beyond the big city. Um, we have a wonderful new team of guides that we all met up in Gdansk back in May to start this tour. Polish guides who have mainly been local guides for us before, but we were training them to be lead guides on this tour. And I have to say, I was just so impressed by these guides. They didn't need really any training or mentoring at all. They were ready to go out of the box. And so this tour is in very good hands. And we had a wonderful time on that the first departure, as I said. That tour does go to Krakow, of course, because how could you not go to Krakow? But there's a lot more, again, whether you're on a tour by on yourself, uh, there's a lot more to Poland other than Krakow. So I'm going to name a few of the, the big destinations that you might consider as you're planning a trip there. One of them, of course, is the capital city, which is Warsaw. Warsaw is obviously the biggest city in Poland. It's almost as big as Budapest, really a big city. And it kind of has a bad reputation for being kind of gloomy. And that's partly because it was very, very badly destroyed in World War II. This is a digital reconstruction of what Warsaw looked, uh, looked like at the end of World War II. But it has been beautifully restored in certain places, actually feels very upscale and kind of swanky. And one thing that they restored quite meticulously was the old town of Warsaw. Now, I wouldn't go to Warsaw for the old town. There's much more interesting and authentic old towns in other places. But there is a very large and beautiful old town for those who'd like to see that. One thing I love about Warsaw beyond those historic sites, it has a great kind of youthful contemporary 21st century life. It's a great food city. It's a great place to go out and see real life going on in the streets. Um, it's a great place for restaurants. Um, so Warsaw has kind of a, a youthful vitality that I really appreciate. Of course, as the capital city, it has lots of great museums and one of the best museums, and really I think this is one of the best historical museums anywhere in Europe, 
just opened a few years ago, and it's the Museum of the History of Polish Jews. And we've talked already quite a bit about the importance of Jewish heritage in all of these countries. And I have never seen a museum in Europe that does such a beautiful job of telling the story of Jewish people as this one here in Warsaw. It's a huge museum. Uh, you can get a great tour guide when we take our groups here. We have a great guide who leads us through it. And you, what I like about this museum is, of course, we talk about the Holocaust um, and talk about that dark chapter of the history. But so many of the sites in these countries kind of focus on that. And I think this museum in particular does a beautiful job of giving some context and telling the whole story of Jewish people um, throughout their time here in Poland, uh, including going back into history. And so for me, this is a very, very satisfying museum. Another thing in Warsaw that's very special is they have a strong connection, like all Polish people do, to Friedrich Chopin, this composer. Now, you might think Chopin is a French composer. He's actually uh, has a Polish mother. He has a French last name, but he has a Polish mother and he grew up here in Warsaw. And he even after he went to France and lived there in exile where he became famous as a composer, he always had a very special place in his heart for Poland. In fact, this is a very popular sculpture in Warsaw. And it's said it's based on this quote that Chopin said where uh, when I play my music, to me, it sounds like the wind blowing through the willow trees of my native land of Poland. So it just shows you the deep connection between Chopin and Warsaw. And <clears throat> that's, that sculpture is in the middle of a big park. And every Sunday through the summer, they have these big outdoor concerts. And the whole city comes out to celebrate. There's lots of other ways you can have a Chopin concert. For example, there's a little B&B &B that we've had in our guidebook for years that does a wonderful little uh, Chopin concert every evening in a beautiful drawing room setting. And it's a B&B &B that's owned by this guy. His name is Yadik. And I just wanted to mention this. It's a great way that here at Rick Steves, we have this wonderful connection, this sort of synergy between our guidebooks and our tours. So we discovered Yadik and put him in our guidebook many years ago. And he's had hundreds, thousands of our Rick Steves guidebook readers as guests. And when we said, let's do a Poland tour, we decided, well, of course, we should stay at Yarek's hotel when we're in Warsaw. I should say the name of the hotel is the Boutique B&B, &B, uh, Boutique Hotel now, I think. Chopin Boutique Hotel is the name of his hotel. Um, anyway, uh, we knew that we'd be well taken care of by Yadek, and our group really enjoys getting to know him. But he really created this amazing moment on the tour, and I think it's something that represents the kinds of experiences we look for in a Rick Steves tour. And that is this. We had planned a dinner at a pretty conventional uh, Polish restaurant with just traditional Polish food. And then we realized Jarek is a very socially active guy and he hires a lot of these Ukrainian refugees to work in his hotel and his restaurant. And Jarek said, you know, would you like me to ask my staff if they would like to prepare for you a Ukrainian dinner instead of another Polish dinner? And we ended up having the most delicious and I think the most memorable dinner of our entire tour here in Jarek's restaurant prepared by Ukrainians who are living in Poland who just were thrilled at having the opportunity to cook their own traditional cooking for this very appreciative group. And Jarek even arranged to have a musician from, Hung uh, from Ukraine come and play this traditional instrument called a bandura. Uh, it was an incredible moment and we were able to do it for all of our tours that year. And I, I just think it's a good example both of that synergy between our guidebooks and our tours. It's also just a way that you know, what's happening in Ukraine is really tragic. It's horrifying. In a really strange way, traveling in these countries at this moment, it makes that experience even more powerful because you wouldn't have had a powerful experience like this. It, it, it gives context and it puts a human face on what you see in the news. And for me, I think that that's one of the great things about traveling in these countries. A couple other beautiful places to consider going in Poland. There's a red brick city called Torun, which is a gorgeous little town. It's actually the hometown of Copernicus. That's kind of their claim to fame. They're also famous for their gingerbread. So you can go to a gingerbread making demonstration. Um, and it's just an, also a fine small town, a small size city to just wander around and explore. There's also a beautiful, very nearby here, a beautiful red brick castle. It's the largest red brick castle on earth. It's called Malbork Castle. This was the home base of the Teutonic Knights. Um, and that's another place that is worth seeing in this part of we're getting sort of into northern Poland here. But I would say uh, my favorite city in Poland outside of Krakow, I was saying Krakow is kind of the first place you should go in Poland. If you're looking to go to one other place in Poland, I love Warsaw, but I think I'd have to give the title to this fascinating city called Gdansk. Gdansk is the Polish name. You might know it by its German name, Danzig. 
don't go around calling it Danzig these days because Polish people are very proud. This is Gdańsk. But this is sort of the main maritime shipping city on the Baltic Sea of Poland. So this is where the Vistula River, which runs through the whole country, exits out. And it has a real kind of maritime sort of Hanseatic League flavor to it, meaning it's just got a beautiful old town with gorgeously restored old buildings, uh, lots of back streets that are fun to explore. Uh, this is just a beautiful, beautiful place to, to visit. And there's also some really important recent history here because it was the shipyards here at Gdańsk were the home base of the solidarity protests back in 1980. Lech, uh, we, we call him Lech Walesa, but Poles call him Lech Wałęsa, was the leader of these protests. And there's a fascinating museum right here at the place where this actually happened. You can actually walk up to the shipyard gate and you can imagine how this history took place right in this spot. We were talking about the Velvet Revolution in Prague. This is sort of the version of that here in Poland. You can stand at this gate where the shipyard workers were behind the gate and they were doing this peaceful protest against the regime and their relatives and their friends would come to the gate. And this was the one place where they could have contact with their relatives who were staging this bold uprising. Uh, I just want to finish up talking about this tour by describing a beautiful experience we have on this Poland tour. And by the way, like a lot of the stuff we're describing, it's possible to arrange for this even as an independent traveler. But if you do a tour, we make it easy for you. Uh, this is Tomasz and his uh, business partner, Monika, another one of our guides. They have a tour company in Krakow, and they said, we think we should take our groups to do a pierogi making demonstration, but not just in the classroom. We want to actually take the groups into the market. So we went into the old market of Krakow. We actually gave them phrases and taught them how to tell the people working at the market which ingredients they needed. And then we would split up into small groups and went into local homes where we got a hands-on lesson in how to make pierogi from scratch. And I got to tell you, this was a very powerful, vivid, and delicious memory. And I think for a lot of the folks in all of those little groups, it was one of our favorite moments of the whole tour. Um, so thanks for your patience going through all that. I want to review all of these tours one more time, just what's included on the tours. And then Katka and I are going to do a question and answer. So if you haven't put your questions in the chat widget yet, the Q&A chat widget, in about three minutes, we're going to answer any questions that you have about this area. But first, I want to run through these tours again. We've got the Best of Poland in 10 Days tour. And that starts, I kind of did it in reverse when I described it, but it actually starts in Gdańsk, where we have two days. We go to that red brick Malbork castle on our way down to Torun, that beautiful red brick gingerbread city. From there, we go to Warsaw, that great capital city where we have a great time getting to know that city. And we go to that Jewish Heritage Museum and we get to know Jarek and all these other amazing things that you get to do in the big city of uh, Warsaw. And we finish up down in Krakow, that beautiful, beautiful showpiece city in the southern part of Poland. If you're interested in seeing more countries, uh, I love this Best of Eastern Europe in 15 Days tour. We have covered a tremendous amount of ground tonight. And this tour actually hits almost everything that we've talked about except those extra things in Poland. And it also adds some beautiful things down in Croatia and Slovenia. So this is sort of your grand tour. It's your survey tour. It's your sort of, I wanna get a taste of Eastern Europe or Central Europe. I just wanna touch down in each of these countries and start to understand what they're about. And that's what this is designed for. And it does it, I think, beautifully. You start with two nights in Prague, you head over to Krakow for two nights in Poland with a side trip out to Auschwitz for that very important pilgrimage. Then you go down to Eger and that little cute town in Hungary and spend three nights in Budapest to really get your fill of that city. And then from there, you actually go down into Croatia and Slovenia and you see some highlights there. We're gonna take you to the beautiful waterfalls of Plitvica Lakes National Park. Then we're gonna take you to the stunning Croatian coastal town of Rovin. And we're gonna finish up at beautiful Alpine Lake Bled in Slovenia. So all these things I've talked about till now, plus these three things, um, that's the best of Eastern Europe in 15 days tour. It's a wonderful itinerary. And if you're tight on time and you only have a week or so, we have an eight day tour that combines the highlights of Prague and Budapest. So that would be your other choice. And I'll remind you that if you are considering booking a tour, try to consider doing it pretty seriously by the end of January, because if you use that special promo code, you'll get $100 off per seat. Uh, and just as a programming note, thanks for joining us tonight. We're going to do Q&A in a second. If you're curious to learn more about this part of the world, tomorrow night, I'll be joined by our Slovenian friend, Tina Hiti, to talk about Croatia and Slovenia. And now, before we do our questions, I wanted to give Katka the final word. Katka, do you have any final thoughts uh, for people who are curious about visiting these countries? I think that my final words will be simple. You are invited and we very much would like to welcome you here. The sooner, even better. You know, I know that 
probably there is still some like misconceptions, maybe some misunderstandings, maybe some some prejudices, you know, like what is this Eastern part of uh, Europe about? But I can guarantee, because this is what my tour members and my private visitors have told me, you know, once they came, that all these worries will disappear like this once you are here. And I was also thinking about the fact that, you know, travel is the only thing you buy what makes you richer. And I think by visiting these countries in particular, maybe even more because of all this we've just talked about, this will surely be, you know, the thing what you can just benefit from. So please don't hesitate to come. We are waiting. We would be very, very happy to welcome you here. And if you have any questions, what we will now see, we are happy to answer and hopefully to see you soon in Prague or in Krakow or in Budapest or in any of these countries of this beautiful part of the world. Thank you. Katka, that was very well said. Thank you so much. And Ben, I think uh, it's time to answer some questions. It is indeed, I think. Cameron, Katka, thank you so much for that beautiful and thoughtful presentation. I think I speak for all of us when I say you really inspired us to want to go to this area. Um, I'm ready. I'm ready. So I'm also happy to report that our fellow travelers tonight have offered a huge sampling of excellent questions. We're going to start with one several have asked, Catherine, Jason, many others. It is a question about the name of the Czech Republic. Is it called the Czech Republic? Is it Czechia? Perhaps you can explain the difference between these two. Yes, yes, I will. Well, so we do call it still the Czech Republic. I know that maybe from some news, you know, you may know or you have seen the, 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 the one word, the Czechia. We are not very happy about that because also historically it really does not cover what the Kingdom of Bohemia used to be, how we spread a little bit more to the East also. At the same time, in English, it sounds, you know, a little bit like Chechnya maybe, or at least I had such questions here and there if we are somehow related. So if, uh, if we can ask you to use the full term, the Czech Republic, maybe one day we will come up with one word, you know, for as the name of for the country. But as for now, we still use the Czech Republic. So I still have the passport. I still have my ID saying the Czech Republic, even though I know that many journalists, they just call uh, this country to be Czechia, but officially it was never renamed to this. Okay, that's important to know. I will stick with the Czech Republic then. We have a practical question from Teresa. She's wondering what prices are like in this region? What prices are like, like of food maybe, or of maybe whatever. Well, I must say that, uh, of course, we are getting a little bit more expensive, but definitely if compared with the Western part of Europe, it is still a very inexpensive uh, region. What regards food, of course, you know, I mean, restaurants, but even food, what you buy, it is, uh, I would say, yeah, very, very cheap in that way, uh, region. Um, even though, of course, you know, now with the inflation and all that, but still we are, I think we are very, uh, yeah, very, let's say, favorable reason, uh, I mean, region for uh, for the prices of just, you know, whatever you need on a daily basis. And I'll say from a traveler's point of view, it's true. It's, this is, uh, I think it hits a sweet spot of budgetary things where, Definitely, especially Poland, but also to a degree Hungary and the Czech Republic, you really notice prices are lower, but the standards and the quality are still high. And there are countries where you can get even lower prices, but you're sacrificing a lot in standards, if that makes sense. So I, one thing I love about traveling in these places, it's an excellent value because they're in the European Union. Things are very, very, you know, at a, at a European standard, but the prices are at the low end of kind of the European range. I can remember in, in Krakow once visiting a vodka bar and uh, I asked how much one vodka shot was and they said one dollar and I was so impressed. And then the barman said to me, oh, do you have a student card? And I said, yes. And he said, oh, well, then it's only 50 cents per shot for you. <laughs> so I, I that's, I, that's I, dangerous, Ben. <laughs> it's very dangerous. Yes, <laughs> indeed. An additional practical question from Stephen and Terry. 
what do you think? How do you conceptualize the quality of public transportation between cities? And would you say there's much difference between the countries? Well, so I must say that I never thought of this up until I started to travel, you know, around the world. And I mean, to all different directions from uh, my country. And in all these countries, we have it very similar uh, in terms of that it is actually the best way to get around, you know, either walking or using public transportation. We don't bother with driving often just because the driving is maybe not the problem, but the parking in many of the places, definitely for Prague and Krakow, because of all these cobblestone streets, you know, kind of uh, jammed uh, city centers. So uh, if it's in the city or even in between the towns, it is a very reliable way of getting around that you can easily use. It's simple, it's not that complicated, even though if you know the language, you don't have to be worried because of course there is always somebody who can help you. Or, you know, these days we can have all these maps on our phones and so on. So then it makes uh, the way to get around very easy, I think. Yeah, I'm a big fan of renting cars where it makes sense. I love renting a car. I almost never rent a car in these three countries because it's, it's fairly easy to get everywhere that you can by public transportation. Um, well, one interesting solution for that is I mentioned my friend Andrew in Krakow, who's a driver. If you want to go out and have someone take you into the countryside, maybe you want to go research your uh, family roots. Maybe you want someone to take you to Auschwitz and kind of set up all of the visits for you. Uh, maybe there's you want to go up to the mountains. There's some beautiful mountains in the southern part of Poland, for instance. Um, each of these countries has private drivers that you can hire, and they would love to sort of help you get to those things that you really need a car to see. And it's a pretty short list. So a good strategy is to use public transportation and then either rent a car for the day or hire a driver on occasion when there's things that are hard to get to otherwise. Those are excellent tips. Thank you, Cameron and Katka. And Cameron, I recently picked up your book, The Temporary European, and I believe there's some pieces in there about this region. Would you mind telling us a little bit more about your Yeah, thanks about? for mentioning it. Yeah, when I had uh, some time off during the pandemic, we couldn't travel. So I took a sabbatical and I wrote a travel memoir called The Temporary European. And it's basically a collection of all of my favorite travel tales from the 23 years I've been working for Rick Steves. And there's an awful lot of Eastern Europe, of Central Europe in these stories. I have a whole chapter about Budapest and specifically the thermal baths in Budapest and why I love Budapest so much and why the baths are kind of connected to that. So that's just one example. But yeah, thanks for asking. If you're if you're curious to travel along with me and, and know what it's like to hide away in my backpack as I lead tours and update guidebooks, consider picking up the Temporary European. Excellent. I'm looking forward to diving into it further. We have also had a few questions regarding travel in Hungary. Um, how do you think travelers should approach the topic of Hungary's government? Do you think traveling there inadvertently supports the regime? This is a great question and something I think a lot about. We didn't get into it tonight, but uh, Hungary has a uh, uh, prime minister is he a president or prime minister anyway the leader of the country Viktor Orban from Fidesz prime minister prime minister has has been in control for for quite a while now he was just re-elected for yet another term and international observers are concerned because he's made a lot of moves and Hungarians are concerned because he's made a lot of moves that are essentially eroding the democracy of that country um exerting control over the media for example and having really heavy-handed control over what can appear in textbooks and education and so forth um, you know, I think it's very important for travelers to be aware of what's happening in these countries. I think you almost have a responsibility to learn about what's going on and to talk to local people about their perspectives on it. Um, it's an interesting question if, if it's unethical to, you know, go to a place that has a sort of a, a despot in charge. And I think the value of people to people connections kind of transcends an awful lot of that. And I think by traveling to a place like Hungary and talking to people and learning about the day-to-day -day experiences, you become a better informed citizen of the world. And so I think it, in my opinion, this is my personal opinion, I think I think I speak for a lot of us at Rick Steves Europe, you have to cross a pretty bold line for that to no longer be worth it. I think Russia is an example of a case where we did draw that line. We At the day of the invasion, we said, you know what? We're not going to run our tours that go to St. Petersburg. We're going to remove St. Petersburg from the next edition of our Scandinavian and Northern Europe cruise, cruise ports guidebook because we consider the invasion of Ukraine dangerous and unethical. And it's not a country that we choose to support as a travel company. In my opinion, I don't think there are too many other European countries that have crossed that line. And uh, Hungary is 
towing that line. But I, I think for me personally, going there over the years and checking in with my, my, hung, my friends in Hungary and understanding what's happening there has a lot of power and makes me a better global citizen and a more informed consumer of information. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you, Cameron. All right, we have time for just one more question. As you've so beautifully displayed to us tonight, this region has such a complex, uh, charming, uh, powerful culture and history. From each of you, what is one thing, the one thing perhaps, that you want visitors to take away from their visit to Central Eastern Europe, to Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic? I think that you, once you come here, you realize we are not that much different. You know, that maybe you come here with this difference in your mind or like on a mental map or how can I describe that? And then once you experience it, any of these countries, you'll just, you know, drive through, you meet the local people, then you will see that we basically live very similar lives. And I think that this is the best thing what you can take out of your visit in these countries. And I would say, speaking as an American, it's kind of the first thing that I said. Um, I think this is the great underrated chunk of Europe. And I think a lot of Americans have unfortunately not been exposed to how beautiful and wonderful these places are and, and still maybe have these Cold War associations or to them, it's this mysterious land that speak these strange languages that I don't understand. And I'm telling you as an American who's devoted my life to going to these places and meeting these people and learning about these cultures, they're just such wonderful places. They're so, Kaka's right. We're not so different as human beings, but from country to country, I'm just so, I'm actually moved by the differences between the countries. And there's something incredibly satisfying about getting to know a very unfamiliar seeming place and developing an affinity for it and an understanding of it. And if you haven't been to these countries or if you've just been to them superficially, I would sort of challenge you to dig deeper because for me, these countries more, I think, than almost anywhere else, the deeper you dig, the more rewarding it becomes. Thank you so much, Cameron. Thank you so much, Katka, for a great presentation. Um, I can give the final word for the evening. We uh, hope you're able to tune in tomorrow. And um, yeah, thank you so much for joining us on this 11th night of the Festival of Europe. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks. Get some sleep, Kaka. <laughs> I will. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye.